what comes around. An unknown location. 980 IH. The warm and gentle glow of candles crept into the squinting eyes of a Monte Carlos. No forms were visible, just streaks of light across his vision. As his eyes tried to focus, his other senses began functioning. He felt cold. Under his fingers were wood grains. His own weight pressed against his back. He was lying down. His fingers switched. He began to smell the earthly scents of moss and lichens. The air was moist. It also carried in it tones of metal and of meat, scents he commonly associated with war. His eyes began to move. He felt no injuries to his body, no burn of cut wounds, no ache of broken bones. His head began to throb. There was a headache that seemed to come from all over. His mouth was dry all the way down into his throat. He coughed. He began hearing clicking sounds, but reverberating as if they were on the other side of a massive cave. And they were very faint. Now voices, whispers. At least they sounded like whispers. Were they just far away? He couldn't tell. His head rolled to its side. The pressure from his headache eased somewhat, replaced by a sharp pain in the back of his head. It felt like he had been hit. How would that have happened, he thought. His mind slowly began reconstituting his last memories. Ugh, I'm not enthroned fast. I left. I, I'm an outlaw. I saw something. I fled. I came to the sanctum. I was at the sanctum, and... His eyes were still trying to regain their normal function as shapes began to emerge from the light. Stones, were they? They appeared a greenish-gray, lumped up on the other side of the room. His head was beginning to hurt more as his awareness returned to him. He lifted his hand to his head. It stopped. He tried again. He heard a clink. Then he felt the heaviness around his wrist, the harsh edges of metal tugging at his skin. His hands were chained. As his adrenaline kicked in, his senses rushed back to life. Amani jerked his head around the room, blinking furiously to awaken his eyes. Table in the northwest corner. Southwest corner empty with a doorway next to it. Southeast wall was a bit farther away. It was a good sized room. The walls were stone. The doorway had no door. Ugh, my head hurts. The northwest corner held another large table where the stones were. His eyes flickered and squinted. Stones. Not stones. Soft. Draped with canvas. Leather. A leaf? No. Pointy? An ear. A head? A torso. Another head. Another torso. Bodies, a pile of bodies. There were dead bodies piled on the table in the corner. Amani yanked at the chains furiously. They rattled down the corridor and returned, echoing many times over. He cried out in labor, pulling as hard as he could to free himself from his bonds. He stopped, breathing heavily. Calmness is what separates the living from the dead in most battles. For luck would often enough save a man if his courage held. He tried to regain his composure, thinking through his problems. Lying on a wooden table. It's pretty sturdy. Iron shackles in a room with, with no cover. Okay, break the table. No, too sturdy. Fire the table. The sconces are too far away and no way not to burn myself alive. Break chains. Stupid, think. Shackles, shackles come off. Shackles use keys. Now you're thinking. Underneath his waist belt, his hands felt for the iron pins, stashed for occasions needing a sharp tool when none was available. He found in their thin leather slots sewn into the inside of the leather belt. 
Ah, you awaken. Said a voice from the entryway. Amani writhed in his chains. His waist tied down from the chains that ran from the shackles to shackle through the eye hooks mounted to the table. He watched the man walk in, dressed in a fine wool robe, intricately decorated and embroidered. A shawl graced the top of the robe and hung down both sides of his neck with a symbol of Nador. He was a priest of the supremacy, the hub of religious worship for humans in the heart of Thronefast. The priests were inserted into every facet of the lives of men, commerce, legislation, and above all, justice. They wielded the power of magistrates, condemning or freeing those brought up on charges. Amani had brought many a traitor and murderer to their temple for judgment. They were supposedly of upstanding reputation in Candor, but most were politicians who liked the status and power. Right here in my presence, the favored son of Thronefast, Imani Karos himself. The man said, swinging to the side of the table. Even though this may look foreboding, I want you to know that I have always admired you. His face lifted up as his hands began heralding the words out of his mouth. Humble beginning. An alley vulture from the tattered hovels of a small town rises up from nothing to gain the admiration of an entire nation. Good looks. An affable spirit that makes way for the fell beast in times of battle. By the gods, you are magnificent. An inspiration to us all, really. Amani watched him as he circled the table in grandiose manner. So, even though we are here under unfortunate events, I wanted you to know that what I do, I do only in service to my queen and her wishes. Judge, please, listen. Ah, it's justice, Carlos. actually. He said, mocking his own pomposity. I'm sorry, I did not afford you the courtesy of introduction. I am Luke Demeth, the High Priest of Osirico, and the Head Justice of the Judges of Nedor. I am an advisor to my Queen Amanthiel, a stalwart defender of humankind. He said, then leaned over the table and whispered directly into the ear of Amani. And seeker of secret knowledge. Secret knowledge, it appears, is what's brought me into ill favor with my queen. Amani responded sharply. Luke stood up and began pacing again. That's the thing about secret knowledge. Once it is no longer secret, there's a fallout. Generally, some costly consequences. Continue hiding the truth and face being exposed as a liar, losing reputation, livelihood, even life. Coming out with the knowledge and let the commoners sway in the fickle winds of perception. They ask questions, second-guess decisions with the aid of hindsight. It's all so messy and uncontrollable. Luke stopped by the table of dead bodies. Amani was alert enough now to notice they were orc corpses, some covered in large quantities of blood, some missing body parts. Luke bent over to look into one of the faces, as if intrigued by the expression. Osirico likes order, likes control. He fashions everything ahead of time into a plan, and the fates carry it out to the letter. That is why we, as men, pride ourselves on our aggressiveness in accomplishing our goals. We have the drive to see our plans through, to succeed. And when problems arise that stand in the way of the plan, when the rudder is jerked from its set station, we do our part to course correct. Uh, do you sail, Carlos? Amani didn't answer. He rattled his chains, stressing the solid fastenings. <sighs> you 
unfortunately stumbled onto an image and you perceived it to be something it was not, Garos. <laughs> Imani couldn't withhold the slight chuckle at the priest's arrogance. Whether you think you know what you saw or not is irrelevant to my goal. There is a weapon that the orcs have knowledge of. It is a weapon of unimaginable power, which says a lot knowing what an astute pupil of history you are and your journey into the stories of the deicide war. So, when I say unimaginable power, I mean a power that threatens to kill every human on this rock. You see, Kalos, if I do not find the location of this weapon and safeguard it from the hands of our enemies, I am doing a disservice to my queen and my people. And. Unfortunately, those who know of its existence and whereabouts belong to the North Tusk Orcs, who I am sure you are aware are enemies of our people and would relish the opportunity to destroy us if, if they ever understood what power they could wield. If your quest is so noble, why the subterfuge? Amani growled at Luke. I thought you not a fool, young Karos. Don't ask questions to which you already know the answers. The orcs cannot know of our end goal lest they beat us to it. Our allies cannot know lest they want to share it. Our people, our people cannot know lest they raise the North Tusk clan and bring about a war with all orcs worldwide. And this is if they don't start asking questions about how we are getting the intelligence. You see, there are scant few orcs who even know of this weapon and fewer still who know of its history. And, in the course of weeding through the prisoners we take from among the enemy, the enemy has been retaliating. Oh, six of their scouts or traders or infantry, if you could call them that, wind up missing in Thornfastian lands. They want retribution, and so they take it out on the public at large. A farm here, a shop there, a schoolhouse there. We can't tie these heinous crimes back to a tit-for-tat normal. It makes us look less than righteous in our quest for peace and safety. <laughs> peace and safety. Your goals of favor and power overshadow peace and safety. And you pursue it through torture and blood of our people. I saw the bodies in that sewer in Thronefast, and they were not all orc, liar. Our kinsmen laid down on those tables, and that of elves as well. Orc, men, elves, mutilated and tortured. For what? Chasing a fairy's tale of some mythical power lying around for you to take? Amani rattles his chains once more. Luke stopped pacing and turned toward him. A slight grin washed across his face as he stepped toward the table. He placed his hands down on the table and leaned over Imani. Oh, I guess you do know what you saw after all. Just so you know. Those men and elves had been known to conspire with Orc from time to time, learning their culture and their histories. Whether for academia or for more sinister reasons, treason is treason, Garos. And treason is the end of your story. The great, great Himani Garos fraught with Argos the Mighty and kissed by Corsera the Righteous, as they say. We were mourn the loss of our hero, who, tragically, had been twisted by many battles into murdering men and elves in secret chambers. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. God, in here. It's time to mete out this traitor's punishment. Luke chuckled slightly, still leaning over Amani's restrained body. Uh, oh, and to your other point, you're wrong on one account. My master showed me long ago that you don't need favor when you possess power. I will send your regards to him when I see him again. Don't worry, we will find the great weapon, and we will harness it, you know, <laughs> for the good of humankind. 
It's all worth it in the end. Imani raised his head as much as he could and stared the high priest in the eyes. If the good of humankind is what you seek, I've got something. A chain rattled as the right shackle fell from the wrist of Imani. He pinned Luke's hand to the table with his own left hand using the extra slack. The pins were pulled free from the picked lock of the shackle, and Imani shoved them into Luke's neck just behind his earlobe. With the sensitive pressure point ran through, ah. Luke DeMeth screamed in pain and fell to the floor, holding his neck. Amani picked the lock on his left hand and darted toward the exit. As he approached, the guard ran into the screaming priest who had just called for him. Amani met him in the entryway and ran by him, grabbing the hilt of his sword and unsheathing it as he ran. Amani didn't stop as he traversed the cavernous hallways, sword in hand. There were the hallways of a place of which he was all too familiar. The great hall was to the left. He had come from one of the side rooms near the storehouses at the very back of the silent sanctum. The guards shouted down the hall, hoping to alert other guards. Imani knew he had the upper hand with speed and surprise. He ran down an adjacent hallway around the back side of the great hall, candlelit but void of any sign of life or goods. Whatever operation the priest had been involved in down here, it didn't appear he had been here for long. Down here! Shouted a guard who came around the bend of the rounded hallway. Amani ran faster and beat the guards to an entry into the great hall itself. There were tables and chairs set up inside for scholars and the general public to write and congregate. A guard came in the opposite side and headed straight for him. Amani ran into one side of a large table near the center of the room as the guard followed him to that side. He cut back at the last minute and shoved the corner of this table, effectively cutting off his attacker and simultaneously ramming him with a table corner, sending him to his back. Amani ran straight for the entryway into the great hall. He heard no motion on the other side as he approached and ran straight through. The wide opening to the silent sanctum laid in front of him. and There was enough maneuverability out here that he was confident he could get away from any ambush. Stop! said a voice of a soldier who ran outside into the center of the doorway to his freedom. Amani ran with sword at the ready until the silhouette of the man in front of the bright noonday sky came into focus. Amani slowed until he stopped within arm's length of the soldier. It was Turk, Amani's closest friend. Amani, what are you doing? Turk said with a concerned heavy brow fastened above his eyes. Amani could tell Turk was legitimately worried. Turk was always sincere. T, listen to me. These people are lying to you. You know that in your gut. If you believe in me, meet me at Hag Mildred in three nights. Just you. It's okay if you don't, I won't think less of you, but I could use a friend. Take this as a sign. Amani flipped the sword into the air hilt up. He grabbed it by the blade and held it out for Turk. It took Turk a moment to reach out and take it, still stunned to see his friend out here when he was told no one had found Amani Karos, his best friend, since leaving in the middle of the night under suspicious circumstances, being sought after by the queen herself. Amani quickly let go, nodded at his friend, and ran through the door and into the rugged mountainside in the east of the sanctum. The guard raced past Turk, still standing in the doorway and holding the sword in his hand. Turk knew they would not catch him. Nobody could. So how did they, he wondered. Eastern Roan Mountains, later named Avendeer's Pass. First day of the new year, 526 IH. Kidder had followed Val for two days in silence since coming off the mountain. She would not acknowledge his presence, though she did not try to force him away. He was an outcast, made to feel an outcast from an outcast. His stubbornness drove him to continue until she either attacked him or acknowledged him again. The sounds of the forest at night began in the late dusk in the valley. Cater knew the general area they were in. They had never been into the large mountain divide Val was settling into for the night. The mountain walls were steep, which led to the valley being darker than normal for most of the day. He'd never seen anyone trek into it. There weren't even trails worn into the forest at the entrance. Val dropped her pack and began gathering sticks for a fire. She placed her first pile down 
and upon standing back up, Cater dropped another armful on hers. She stared at him for a moment, and then took her foot and kicked half the sticks off the pile, scattering them across the ground. She turned and gathered another pile. Kitty began picking up the sticks she had scattered and looked up just in time to see Val dropping her load onto the pile. He met her eyes, stood up, and walked over to just on the other side of the pile, held out his arms, and dropped the sticks back onto the pile. Kitty held out his arms, antagonizing her to react. It worked. Val stepped over the fire and shoved Cater, knocking him backwards and almost stumbling over a root sticking out of the ground. What? Cater asked in a tone more akin to a command. Make fire, not here. I make fire wherever I please. No, you go there. No, 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 I'm not going anywhere. You go, Uman, or I cut you. Val said, drawing her dagger from her right side. Cater startled her, jumping over the pile of sticks and bending her wrist, releasing her grip on the knife which he rolled out of her hand and into his own. I'd like to see you try. Val growled angrily. Her hands caught fire as she stirred up the magic within her. I will burn you. I don't get hot, remember? I will kill you. Not if I die first. Cater responded, effectively making her pause to think about what he said. I need you, you stupid orc. You know what the giant said, and where to go to find what we're looking for. Val snarled at Cater in between her calculations of what he was saying. You know what the giant said, and where to go to find what we're looking for. And you need me to talk to the god with my magic rock. And we both know neither of us can succeed on our own. Cater picked up a stick and put it in her hand. She held it tightly, glaring at him. He then snatched it from her hand and threw it on the pile of sticks. It was on fire. See? We worked together, we made fire. Cater said, and walked away from her and sat on the other side of the young flames as they matured around the pile of sticks. Val stood there, hand still lightly smoldering, an upset look on her face. She didn't know how to respond. Humans were so different from orc. She was used to being the calculating one over her male counterparts, using them and swaying them. Kitter acted more like an orc female, devising ways to counter her actions and words. The only difference was female orcs were generally in competition, not acting together. The Karuk, the leaders, were the ones who ordered the females to work in unison for strategic purposes. But that didn't carry over into normal life outside of warfare. Val had never had what humans call friends. She didn't even understand the concept. It was something in the realm of someone you worked in unison with and respected for their contributions to your well-being. Why anyone would work for your well-being outside of a mutual benefit didn't seem logical to her. She came slowly to the fire and squatted on the opposite side, still tracking Cater. Why? Why do you not go away? If I fight you, she said. It was obvious in her tone that she was still upset. Cater was getting better at learning her inflections. I told you, I need you, you need me. So, I help you, you help me. Then you go away? What? You don't like my charming personality? Cater noticed his sarcasm was not as recognizable by the other species across from him. Yes. If you want me to go away, I'll go away. Val sat across from the fire, processing. I thought you said an orc without a clan had no respect. You don't have friends? Why don't you make your own clan? Stupid. Orc can make no clan with two orc. I need all clan to respect. To fight. To prosper. Yeah, that's where we're different, Val. I don't need all the humans to respect me. Just the right ones. Val tried to understand what he was saying. It was an odd concept to care about what one human thought and not another human. 
How could anything get done if a clan was split on their plans and actions? I care about my father's last request. I didn't know him. So, like Orc want young ones to know what Orc believe as a group, humans want their young to know what they believe, just the mother and father. The clan of humans is a combination of many, many clans. The fathers and mothers and their children, then their children. Each believes in something different than the next, but they come together when it's important for their safety and the prosperity of their children. At least, that's how it's supposed to go. You have no clan, then? Val said, trying to follow. You say you father die, you mother die, you have no clan. So sometimes people make another clan. You see, they meet each other and they have common beliefs and interests. Sometimes they're different, but they come together because of something that's greater than the differences. We call these friends. So you can have clan of friend? Uh, no. No. So, it's not, it's not that easy. So, I lived, I lived way out in the, in the... You know what? Never mind that. Look, the point is, neither one of us need to be disrespected because our clans have shunned us. We can respect each other. Be our own clan. Fight together for the goals we share. Val sat silent for a long moment, thinking through what he was saying. But I don't respect you. Ugh, you're not going to make this easy, are you? <sighs> yes, I know. I remember what you said. I'm saying we can respect it. <laughs> okay, here, new plan. I understand what you're saying about respect, and I think... I know of a way to earn your respect and for us to work together to both get what we want. <sighs> but it's gonna hurt me. A lot. And I might die if you don't do your part to save me. So I'm trusting you to save me. Can I trust you to save me? Val sat back, more at ease than before, and her mannerisms relaxed. She thought about it for a moment and responded. Tell me more about the hurting. Silent Sanctum Keep, 980IH. The night after Amani Karos' escape. The full moon of Lauta blazed through the opening in the fourth floor room where Luke Demeth lay, trying to sleep off his wounds. His head throbbed, even after taking several herbal teas to dull the intense pain of the injury to his neck. The injury to his pride was just as intense, but the unbelievable escape of Amani Karos. He even delivered himself into Luke's hands and still managed to get away. That was a problem for the morning, Luke thought to himself. The interrogations had finally seen some useful intel about a known location of the stone over a hundred years ago. He hoped they would find clues to its whereabouts after conducting a full investigation of the site that was named. But for now, he needed rest and for this pain to go away. The room seemed to darken slightly as Luke began to close his eyes. Good evening, Justice, said a low voice with the crisp musical quality known to be of one particular race. Luke turned over to see a tall, shrouded figure standing in front of the window. <laughs> it's you. Luke said, pulling himself up to a partially seated position on the bed. You had to gloat over the embarrassing escape or over my injuries. You'd never miss an opportunity to relish in someone's misfortunes. <coughs> Oh, how right you are, Justice, but no, I'm not here to gloat, or to relish, or chat about your problems. I've been sent to resolve them. What? 
Did he send you to track Karos? I'd usually despise the lack of faith in my efforts, but, to be honest, Karos is a warrior's warrior. I could use all the help I can get. Yes, indeed. You mm, do need someone else to hunt for Karos, but you again missed the point of my visit. I was sent by our employer, but not for Karos. No. Luke's face became serious. Immediately. He has sent me for you. Luke looked around, wondering how far away his guards were right now. He said you were now a liability that needed to be managed before the errors became mm, too numerous to explain away. Oh, well... <laughs> You know, I couldn't miss an opportunity to, as you say, relish in others' misfortunes. Hmm. Hmm. Luke began to yell, but as fast as he could get it out, the cloaked assassin was at his side, covering his mouth, as Luke felt a hot pressure on the side of his neck. Oh, no justice, he said, still cupping Luke's mouth. Don't make this hard. I bring you relief from your troubles. Once I remove the scalpel from your neck, your agony will melt away. <laughs> Rest in the belief that your Osirico wrote this in the stars countless years ago. And now you are able to finish his plan for you. He removed his hand from his mouth, confident that the pressure building up around the artery he severed would keep him from moving too much. But, alas, into the waiting arms of your Corsera you will not fly, for your deeds have been weighed on the scales and your trespasses have outweighed your good intentions. Yes, I'm afraid to Ulthiro's bosom you will fly and be tormented. The assassin leaned in close to Luke as he struggled for breath while his face turned pale. For my brother was found in the chamber of your questioning, and he was not living. He had been tortured by your command. Pity you did not know we were related, for if you had, you would have known not to tamper with the family of a myrrh as dark as me. The myrrh slid his scalpel out of the side of Luke's neck and stood by, watching pressure release and blood spill out in waves onto Luke's robe. Luke had enough time to contemplate his last few missteps before the last beat of his heart was felt. The assassin removed a small river stone from his pocket and tossed it into Luke's lap and disappeared as silently through the window as he had entered. The stone lay on Luke, face up, with an intricately carved M filling the top. The calling card of the infamous mercenary in the employ of Luke Demeth's master, who was resting peacefully in his grand bedroom back in Thronefast.